course, we will look into it. Yes, I'm aware that it's an election year. Keep a hold of your hat, Counselor. Now is not the time to lose your nerve. It would appear that someone has hocked a rose gold wedding ring, a matching engagement ring. Sound familiar? Deirdre Muller. Press the pawnbroker and see what you can find out. The address is 348 South Main Street. The Muller case goes before the grand jury next week and the DA does not want any egg on his face. Then get out to the railroad depot on Santa Fe Avenue. We have another poor unfortunate found this morning beside a railroad line. 40-year-old white woman. Right, Skipper. Deirdre Muller was the victim in the Golden Butterfly case. Remember, we imprisoned her husband, Hugo, after catching him burning evidence in a barrel in his backyard. But if this is really his wife's ring, then that means Hugo is innocent. Another body and Deirdre Muller's ring. The Emperor may soon have to come to terms with the fact that he's wearing no clothes. What exactly did you get that book of riddles shoved up your ass, Phelps? Is that what your old man paid college tuition for? It's possible Hugo really did kill his wife, but for these rings to show up at a pawn shop, that would mean someone stole the rings off of Deirdre's finger after discovering her body in the park. And it would mean that the same thing happened to all of the other female corpses from the other homicide cases we've explored. That's a bit too much of a coincidence. Occam's razor tells us that the one who pawned the rings is likely the person who last had contact with her alive. And that would mean her killer is still on the loose. You've got to admit, this is looking odd. Nah, anyone could pawn a ring. But if you take it along with all of the other indicators... Cole, Hugo Moeller was identified by the school's groundkeeper. He's our guy. Witnesses have fingered the wrong guy before. He ran, for God's sakes. And he always maintained he was set up. We arrive at the Globe Loan and Jewelry Company at 1022 in the morning. How can I help you boys? Detectives Phelps and Galloway, LAPD. You have a rose gold wedding and engagement ring? David Bremner. Am I going to get something for this pledge? I gave that bum money, now you guys are going to leave me short. How much did you give him? 50 bucks. Try another number. 20? Try 10. You feel lucky you're getting it. I have the rings right here. Taking a closer look... What's this mark here? Maker's mark. Usually traceable. That one came from Hartfield's Jewelry down on Broadway. Thanks for the tip. A ring we can trace. A ring we know belonged to Deirdre. Does this mark mean anything? Hallmark. Gives you an idea of the quality. What have you got on the guy who brought these in? Goes by the name of Percy B. Shelley. Gave an address. 15 Poland Street, London, Tulare County. Can you give us a description of the man who pawned these rings? Not sure. Medium height, medium build, dark hair, I think. Sorry. He just had one of those forgettable faces. We'll be in touch, Mr. Bremner. Great, so we have an address, right? So we can track this guy down. But sadly, Cole is one step ahead of us. We have a problem. We could have the local troopers check out the Tulare County address. The address is bogus. Kirk is having fun with us. The guy who's been sending the Dahlia letters is also the guy who pawned these rings. How do you figure that one? Percy Bysshe Shelley wrote the poem that came with the Dahlia letter. The Dahlia letters are genuine, and the man who killed Elizabeth Short may have also killed Deirdre Muller. And how do we prove that, Phelps? Skipper ain't gonna like this one bit. We're gonna have to rely on this guy tripping up on his own vanity. But now we have another crime scene to visit. Another dead woman killed in the night. You boys ready? Follow me. We should keep this development with the rings under our hat until we speak with the captain. We're all on the same team, Rusty. Chain of command, Phelps. The skipper will decide who needs to know. You got it? I get it, Rusty. I just don't like it. We arrive at the rail yard at 11.02 a.m. The coroner is already hunched over the corpse. (laughs) 
art, isn't it? Yeah. I look after all the rail depots. What have you got? The Negro, Nelson Gaines, called it in. I came down here to make sure him and the other guy, Jameson, stuck around. Jameson found the body? Something like that. Guy makes me sick. We'll talk to the coroner. Keep an eye on both of them. We'll start by talking with the rail yard employee. Detective Phelps and Galloway, homicide. Can you tell me exactly what happened? We were shunting cars over to the main line when I saw this man here lying on top of this woman. The woman wasn't moving and seemed to be in a bad way. What time was this? About 7.30 this morning, sir. Thanks for your help. Have you given Patrolman Hart your details? I have, sir. Thank you. You can go now. Before we talk with this Jameson, we can head over to Carruthers to see what he has to say about the corpse. What have we got here? White female, approximately 40 years of age, lipstick smudges on the face, but no writing, at least nothing legible. A blunt force trauma to the temple nose and eye regions. Ligature marks point to the probable cause of death being strangulation. Any idea of the time of death? From her temperature, after midnight would be my guess. Nearby, we see blood spatter on the ground and the side of a rail car. Blood splatter on the carriage. She must have been struck while standing up. Moving to the corpse, we can inspect the face. Smell? Very good. There is the usual evacuation smell, but it appears she's been living rough for quite some time. Very strong smell of alcohol. Well, the autopsy will tell, but I would assume that she was inebriated. So in addition to the evacuation smell, she had the strong smell of a homeless person, alcohol, and having not bathed in a very long time. Moving to her right hand... Another missing ring. Certainly seems I've been swabbing a lot of bare fingers recently. Can you be more exact about the time of death? No later than 2 a.m. The state the body was in, a one or two hour window is the best I can do. Just what are the odds that a thief happens upon the corpses of every single murdered woman we have found to steal their rings before the police arrive? It's just too far-fetched to believe that as coincidence. We're dealing with the same murderer, with the exact same M.O. The left hand is empty and we find no further clues on the body, but nearby, we find her personal effects. Inside her red purse, we find two items of interest. The first is a handwritten note. Dear Evelyn, I hope that this letter finds you in a better way than when we last parted. Bitter words were exchanged. You had taken too much liquor, and we both know what that makes you become. But I'm not writing to harass or accuse. I'm writing to apologize. I was heartbroken seeing what has become of my little girl and what she is doing to herself. You are destroying your body and your soul with liquor, Evelyn. And it is harder for me to watch than you can imagine. But only God Almighty above us has the right to judge. And so I beg your forgiveness. I've been in contact with a sanatorium here in Connecticut on your behalf. They say your condition is an illness, Evelyn, and that it can be treated. You only need to check yourself in. It will not... Someone was trying to get her to come home. But there the message ends because the note has been torn in half. Did the killer do this? Why would the killer tear such a personal and heartfelt note in half and leave one half for the police to find? But this letter's existence is great news. It means that there was still someone on this earth who cared about Evelyn, someone possibly whom we can track down. Also inside the purse is a pink card. We could go over to the lot and see what they know about her. That's gonna be difficult, Cole. Keystone Studio lot closed back in 41. She used to work at the Keystone Film Company in the legal department, but the company closed down years ago, and yet she kept the card. This may have been the last job she ever had. Maybe she was really proud to have that job, and losing it absolutely broke her. Perhaps the shame of losing that job and her inability to find a new one is what drove her to drink, is what contributed to her homelessness. To have kept this card in her purse for all these years tells us that she was proud of once being a productive member of society. Lying on the cloth next to the purse is a book of matches. Maybe someone at Mensch's will remember her. Looks like we've found one of her frequent haunts. We'll have to head on over to see if anyone knew Elizabeth. And lying next to the book of matches... 
This is a chit for personal items, not booze. It's not even worth investigating. Looks like a grocery list, but written on a liquor store receipt? But upon closer inspection, we see it's not a grocery list. Two large suitcases, a bedroll, pillows, bowling pin, statuette? It reads more like an inventory. But why was it written on a liquor store receipt? But to get this receipt, she must have visited this liquor store, which gives us one more place to visit, Levine's Liquor Store. That's all the evidence we find at the crime scene. Now to talk with Jameson, a man who was found lying on top of her. Detective Phelps, LAPD homicide. John Ferdinand Jameson. We need you to answer some questions, John. If you don't mind, I prefer Ferdinand. Don't push your luck, knucklehead. What were you doing to the body, Ferdinand? Are you sure you won't be upset? Try me, Ferdinand. I was kissing her. It's not against the law. Shut up. There's no Take law your against it. Like a man. Turn out your pockets, Ferdinand. Good man, Galloway. If anyone deserved a cheap shot. Classic Carmine. The same brand of lipstick used by Celine Henry. The same brand used by the killer to write messages on her body in the red lipstick murder. But is this just coincidence? After all, Evelyn's body was still clothed, and we didn't find a note written on it. But why did Jameson here take the lipstick to begin with? Is this yours, Ferdinand? No. I found it near her purse. I thought she could use some lipstick. Rusty, stop! Don't hit him. Before Rusty beats this guy to death, let's see if we can get some questions out of him. You uh, went through her purse? It wasn't like she needed it. I took a look. Gosh, this guy. He seems to be operating under the delusion that any type of behavior is appropriate as long as it's not against the law. And the way he's holding himself here is defiant, arrogant, as if he truly thinks that he hasn't done anything inappropriate. Quit staring at me like I'm some kind of freak. He claims he took a look in the dead woman's purse. At this point, we have no reason to believe that he is lying. Did you take any money? Wasn't any to take. I found her lipstick and her matchbook over on the mat. Not much else. She was a transient, so he's likely telling the truth. Besides, if he had taken her money, we would have found it on him. We can then ask him about exactly how he discovered her body. You found the body? Yes, I did. I work here. I was coming off shift and headed home. A plausible explanation, but he's holding out on us. He's not telling us the whole story. This is evidence by the way he's holding himself. He's shifting his weight from one foot to the next. He has his hands in his pocket, rolling his eyes as if we're wasting his time. As if we're boring him. He just wants this conversation to be over. But it doesn't work like that, Jamison. And so we'll encourage Cole to play the bad cop to get this guy to open up a bit more. Why didn't you report the body, Jamison? Do you know how this is going to look to a jury? A jury? What gives? I, I can tell that she was dead. I came through here about midnight last night. She wasn't here then. Let me belt him again. You're under arrest, Jameson. We'll see how this plays out. Until then, you can think a little on how you'd like to be treated if you were found dead. I'm telling you, it's not illegal. Me and some friends of mine... Clyde, can you get this sack of shit into a cell? I'll deal with him later. Sure, Rusty. <laughs> Oh, Rusty. I'm so glad he's here. Nice day for it. But if he's telling the truth, it means she was murdered after midnight. But that's still a wide window. Let's see if we can narrow this down. We'll start by getting the location of Levine's liquor. To do so, we'll head to the nearby Gamwell and phone in to R&I. Phelps, 1247. How can I help, detective? I need an address on Levine's liquor. Closest store to the Santa Fe Avenue rail yard, if possible. Just a moment, detective. Closest door would be the one at 939 South Hope Street. Thanks. We've got an address. Let's find out exactly what Evelyn was doing writing that interesting inventory list on a liquor store receipt. You read that those goddamn Chinese want to sell the relief food that we're sending them? Yeah. Yeah, I read about that. Those people are starving. They can't do that want to sell the food to fund the civil war against the communists. Really? I guess that's okay, then. 
Armies can't fight without food. You spend all your money on weapons, but you still have to have the will to fight. Fortunately, the Reds will win in China. Watch your mouth. You know what you're saying? The people of this country overthrew a king. You think the Chinese will balk at an emperor if they are starving? Sadly, Maoist communism didn't really do much to help the issue of starving in China. One great leap forward, 55.6 million great leaps back. We arrive at Levine's at 11.33 a.m. What can I do for you? LAPD, Phelps and Galloway. We're making inquiries into the murder of Evelyn Summers. Evelyn? She's dead? You knew Evelyn Summers, Mr. Robbins? Yes, I knew Evelyn. I was a good friend of her ex-husband. She kept some of her stuff here. Can you show us, please? Sure. Come this way. Her ex-husband? Could this have been a simple lover's dispute? Mr. Robbins takes us through his stockroom. You got some fine stock here, Mr. Robbins. You know, you let us take some for the road, this case might get solved a lot quicker. He's joking, Mr. Robbins. And then brings us to his delivery garage. Here we find a corner sectioned off with a sheet. This must have been where Evelyn was staying. On the ground next to her mattress, we find a book. Evelyn was reading Aristotle? Evelyn wasn't stupid. The only stupid thing about her was her need to drink. Aristotle's metaphysics. Some light bedside reading? And she was borrowing books from Grosvenor McCaffrey. Borrowing or, quote, borrowing. But who exactly was Grosvenor? Next to this is a photograph from happier times. She wasn't always such a loner reminder of exactly what addiction can do to a person, though the alcoholism may have been a symptom of something darker, rooted deeper in her psyche. It could have been the result of shame after losing her job. Perhaps that's why she became a loner. She was too ashamed to associate with other people. Examining her things, we see a broken mirror, some personal effects, clothing piled on a chair nearby, another framed photograph, and this looks like a photograph of when she was a young girl, which means that the woman she's standing next to might be her mother, and we remember the heartbreaking letter we found in her purse. It's good to see this photograph here. It tells us that she still loved her mother, that she wasn't angry with her. It tells us that her mother's letter was likely well-received. It tells us that maybe she was planning to go home to seek help. Maybe she was taking her mother's plea seriously, and that had she not been murdered, maybe she would have gone home back into the loving arms of her mother. It gives us one more reason to track down her killer. Moving to the opposite corner, we find a few items on that inventory list. I'm guessing Evelyn hadn't held down a job for quite some time before she was killed. It's her name plaque from when she worked in legal at the studio. She's kept it all these years. It's among her prized possessions. Yet more evidence that the lifestyle she adopted was a direct result after losing a job that gave her her dignity. Next to this is an award. When exactly did Evelyn work in the pictures? A few years ago. She worked in legal copyrights for music. Cole should have known the answer to this. After all, we found her business card in her purse. Though the existence of this statuette is perplexing. I don't know of many people who work in the legal department of studios who walk away with trophies like this. And then on the ground nearby is a bowling pin. Rawlings Bowling Alley. Maybe Evelyn did something other than drink in her spare time. Rawlings. I know that place. Corner of 9th and Grand. A lot of cops bowl there on Tuesday nights. One more place to check out. And now we better understand the inventory list. It was an inventory of all of her personal possessions, everything she owned in the world. And it was on a Levine's liquor store receipt because that's where she was staying. But why was she making up a list? Let's talk with Mr. Robbins to find out. We find him back in his stockroom. We'll start by asking him about his contact with the victim. We're trying to account for Evelyn's movements yesterday. She came by in the morning. A social visit to pick up some of her things? She had a couple of bucks and bought a quart of rye. 
She had a couple of bucks, and she used that money to buy a quart of rye, what, to drink herself? Early in the morning? It's a bit early to start drinking, but then again, she did have a problem. And examining Mr. Robbins here, wow, he really seems shook up. He just learned about Evelyn's death, and we can see the pain in his face. His eyes are slits. His face is drawn, and every now and then he gulps. He looks like he's just been gutted. We have no reason to suspect that he is lying. He must be telling the truth. Any idea where the money came from? She didn't mention it. But she did say the booze was a present for a boy. She said they had been fighting and she had to make it up to him. Oh, so she didn't buy the booze to drink. She bought it as a gift. But wait a minute. She came back here in the morning to buy booze for a boy she had recently had an argument with. Well, then I guess that means what? She had been out all night? Who was this boy? But more pressing, why was she staying here? How well did she know Mr. Robbins? What exactly was the nature of their relationship? Were you and Evelyn close, Mr. Robbins? How many people will be sad she's gone? I'll be one of the few. Okay. But exactly why will he be one of the few? He mentioned being a friend of her ex-husband. Did he and her ex-husband fall out when they divorced? Was he allowing her to stay here just because he had pity on her? Or did he have other intentions? His behavior here hasn't changed. He still meets eyes with Cole Phelps, and he still looks devastated by the news. We have no reason to believe that he's lying. We got the impression that Evelyn had been sleeping rough of late. It became difficult for me to have her staying here. Her mother was trying to get her back on the straight and narrow. She's old now. And to be honest, you have to have a good reason to want to get back on. Ah... So he allowed her to stay here because of his friendship with her ex-husband. But when her drinking and lack of bathing and smell became too much, he decided to kick her out. That's why she was taking inventory of all of her personal possessions. And that's why she stayed somewhere else last night. He didn't want her here. And she was going to come back later for her things. But who was it that she stayed with? Who was this boy she bought alcohol for? Could it have been Grover McCaffrey? The name we found on the inside of Metaphysics? Do you know a friend of Evelyn's by the name of McCaffrey? Not personally. Oh, all right, well, thanks for sharing. But we don't really care exactly how personally you know the guy. We want to know if you know him and to what extent you know him. It's clear he'd rather not talk about Grover McCaffrey. His answer was evasive and he's no longer making eye contact. We don't have evidence that he's lying to us, but we can doubt that he's telling us the full story. We're struggling for leads, Robbins. Did she know McCaffrey? She idolized him. From what I gather, the feeling was far from mutual. He seems to peddle a revolutionary stance, fixing the ills of society. You could see how it would appeal to down and outs like Evelyn. Thanks for your help, Mr. Robbins. No problem. Hey, I'd like to make arrangements for the funeral. You think I could get in touch with Evelyn's mother? Put in a call to the watch commander at Central Station, Mr. Robbins. He'll be trying to reach the next of kin. Thanks. Get the guy, huh? Evelyn never hurt anybody. So he didn't want to paint a negative picture of Evelyn. That's why he was withholding evidence. Now we know that she was idolizing this guy. Is this the same boy she bought the alcohol for? We need to find him. And we have two places to look. The bowling alley, where she got that bowling pin, or the bar, where she got the matches. We'll start by going to the bar. We arrive at 11.46 a.m. Drink, fellas. Phelps, Galloway, homicide. We need to ask you some questions concerning Evelyn Summers. I'm Walter Mensch. Evelyn Summers? What is it now? You knew Evelyn? As well as I wanted to know Evelyn. She's a pain in the ass, always coming in here, cadging drinks, never had any money. She was in just a couple of nights ago. Did she ever tell you where she was staying? I don't know. I think she was living rough. She had that kind of stunk about her. Who did she drink with? Uh, a bunch of these guys. Ask around. Oh, a bunch of these guys? All right. Uh, uh, okay. Well, that makes it easy. 
we'll ask this guy. What's your name? Grosvenor McCaffrey. Mind if I ask you some questions, Mr. McCaffrey? I'm just a starving writer, detective. What do you want to ask about? Evelyn Summers and why she was found beaten and strangled in the rail depot on Santa Fe. Okay. I see your point. How well did you know her? I can't say that I knew her. It was more like I was aware of her. Oh my. Right. Well, Robbins told us that this Grover McCaffrey was a bit of a revolutionary. Maybe the police have a file on him. We could ask him about his criminal history. Do you have a criminal record, Mr. McCaffrey? Nothing serious. I've had a few skirmishes. Ooh, that seems to have gotten his attention. He didn't meet eye contact until the very end of his answer, and now he's being evasive again. He is looking up to the side. He opens his mouth as if to say, uh, and then gulps. He is looking nervous. You guys got somewhere you need to be? You're ruining the ambiance. Oh, and he's a snarky little twit to boot. We'll go ahead and doubt that he's telling us the whole story. Do you want to save me some time, or do you want me to look up your file? Industrial disputes, strikes, workers' rights, that kind of thing. A regular fifth columnist. Nice to meet you, comrade. All right, so a bit of a record, but nothing terribly serious. Next, we'll ask him exactly how well he knew Evelyn. You say you barely knew Evelyn? Yes, that is correct. But again, with the fish-out-of-water expression, he just can't decide where he wants to rest his gaze. But we don't have to doubt his story here. We know that he's lying. You're lying, McCaffrey. You look down your nose at Evelyn, but you knew her, and you have some idea of what happened. I hope you're holding aces. I'm telling you again, I barely knew the woman. He barely knows the woman, and yet he knows her well enough to lend her a copy of Metaphysics, complete with his name on the inside cover. A piece of evidence we'll use to accuse him of lying. Why would you lend her your book on Metaphysics if you only knew her in passing? It was more than that. A Renaissance man like yourself lending his books to his acolytes. She hounded me about that goddamn book. And then she lifts it from my apartment and lies to my face that she didn't take it, as if she could even comprehend any of it. I saw her go into a hotel with Tiernan last night. They had booze in a paper bag. He's your man. Thank you for the information, Mr. McCaffrey. Whoa! Well, what a charming guy. Completely full of himself. But at last, we have a suspect. He claims to have last seen Evelyn going into a hotel room with the one Tiernan. But he didn't give us a location of this Tiernan. The only other lead we have is the nearby bowling alley. But just as we get in our car to head that way... Car 11K, Car 11 King, KGPL. 11 King. A message from Captain Donnelly, return to Central, go to... 11 King, en route. Let's not keep the man waiting, Phelps. Now, despite the urgency of this call and Rusty's recommendation that we head to Central, we can't go back to the captain with nothing to show for our time. So before going back to Central, we'll head to Rawlings Bowling Alley. We arrive at 12.24 p.m. And the lanes are hopping. Hello, Rusty. Two on your usual lane? But Rusty's here on business. I'm Detective Phelps. Homicide. You must be new. <laughs> What's your shoe size? We're conducting an investigation, ma'am. Do you know the name Evelyn Summers? Sounds like I should. Oh, maybe it could be Jimmy's friend. Jimmy? James Tiernan. He's a pin setter. One day he introduced me to a lady after work. Stuck in my mind. Because she was much older, too old for him. Where can we find Jimmy, Florence? He'll be hopping around the lanes toward the back. Thanks, ma'am. 
Jimmy Tiernan. Let's go get him. Oh, Cole seems to be confident that we've found our guy. And maybe he has good reason after all. Jimmy was the last person confirmed to be seen with her. Turning around and moving towards the lanes, we can go through the door furthest to the left. And as soon as we enter the hallway... Tiernan! LAPD! Jimmy does a runner. Why exactly are you running, Jimmy? Cole and Galloway chase him outside, where Tiernan leaps into a car. But Galloway's is parked on the other side of the building. There! And so Cole commandeers a nearby sports car. Look at this little thing. What are you waiting for? Get after him! We might go faster if we weren't carrying the extra weight. Yeah, Galloway, lose a few. These are flashy cars to be parked outside a bowling alley. The lanes attract a fast-living individual with money to burn, Cole. Or a middle-aged individual with the need to feel virile. It's the first time I've heard a bowling alley being described as attracting the fast-living individual, but okay. Hit him! Clean this asshole off the road! Another runner. Well, at least we've got a suspect. Why do they always run? I'm sure we've got the wrong person in more than one of these homicides, but they always seem to land it. You know, your theories are not very tight by any means. Keep it steady and I'll try to bust his tire. If you can hit the tire. If this isn't the killer, we can at least get him from reckless endangerment. That's unless he runs into a wall and saves us all the trouble. Hit the ground. Hit him, Cole. Spin him out. And that is the end of that. It's about fucking time. Not exactly sure how I stopped him there, but hey, I'll take it. With our weapon drawn, we can approach the car. Give it up, LAPD. Oh, crap. With our suspect handcuffed, we can sit him down in the air. <laughs> All right, Rockstar. But at last, we have a suspect in custody, and he ran to boot, and running means he has something to hide. We can now head back to Central to see exactly what the captain wanted. Heading inside... The captain is downstairs with Ray Pinker and Carruthers. Looks like we need to go downstairs. Moving right, we can go down the hallway and open the double doors to the receiving hospital. We find technical services downstairs. Let's see what they have to say. What's this about, Captain? Ray and Mal have some concerns over the Henry and Muller cases, which I don't want aired outside of this room. The evidence is solid, Captain. I agree, Rusty. It's just that corpses keep piling up. Copycats. I've been banging the same drum. But the notes and the lipstick messages. Evelyn Summers, cartel classic Carmine. Each woman, same brand, same color. Teresa Terrelson didn't have a lipstick message. Technically, you're right, Rusty. She didn't have any lipstick, but she did have a message. We found it beneath her dress, scraped with a sharp stick. What did it say? You sure you want to know, Ray? As far as we can be sure, it said, Cunt BD. That's one way of looking at it. Looking at what? Cunt is all about access, Phelps. You're married, so yours is mortgaged. Some of us like to pay by installments. This guy doesn't like to pay at all. Why are you so angry, Mal? Because I just had to fire one of my assistants. He was a friend of Jameson's. God knows what he might have been up to. Captain, we have good leads in the Summers case, but it's up to you to decide how we proceed. Keep this under your hat for now. And to follow up on Evelyn Summers, I want daily reports. Ah, oh, so Jameson was friends with the coroner's assistant? Exactly how many corpses has he kissed? We got our orders. Back to the Summers case. Get an address for McCaffrey. He'll have blown the bar. I'll meet you outside. But we learned something important. With the discovery of the scrawled message beneath Teresa Terrelson's corpse, now every body we've discovered so far has come with a message, and almost all of them are signed BD. Black Dahlia. Now, before we talk with Tiernan, we need to have another word with Grover McCaffrey. After all, he seemed to know Tiernan well, and he knew that Tiernan was Evelyn's associate. And exactly how did he spy them going into a hotel room together? Unless he was following them, but why would he be following them? We'll head to the nearby phone to see if we can get his address from R&I. Grover McCaffrey. Apartment 6, 126 Yale Street, between Ord and Alpine. Thank you. Address in hand, we can have Rusty drive us there. 
You know the way. You can drive. Let me pose a question. Depends. What's it got to do with? Morals. Would it bother you to put the wrong person away? Depends. On what? On whether anyone except the poor son of a bitch in the slam ever found out. Ah, Rusty. His lack of any morals or ethical backbone never ceases to disappoint. At least he knows when to punch the right person. We arrive at McCaffrey's apartment at 4.32 p.m. Heading up the stairs, we can learn his apartment number from the nearby mailboxes. McCaffrey is in apartment six. Let's hope number six is on the main floor. Let's see. Two. Staircase crossing the hall. Then three. Ah, oh, no, it's upstairs. All right. Racing upstairs to the second floor, and we see seven and eight are to the right, five or six to the left. Turning left, we find McCaffrey's apartment to the right. Doesn't look like anybody's home. Terrible shame. Means there's nobody to let us in. You want to do the honors, Phelps? Surely he couldn't still be at the bar. His apartment is pretty modest, a tiny kitchen, remains of his breakfast on a table. Moving to the living room, we see some of his clothes tossed about. He has a writer's desk against the wall, inspecting it. What have we here? It's none other than the bottom portion of the letter Evelyn's mother wrote to her. And we can finally finish it. It will not take long before you are healed and you can come home. I have put your things back into your old room, put the lock on the door for your privacy, and you can come and go as you please. I will care for you, and you can return to your normal life. I know your address has changed, so I cannot be sure this letter will find you, but I pray that it does, and that you will consider what I have said. I love you very much, and I pray every night that you are safe, and that one day you will knock on my door, and the rift between us will be mended. With love and understanding, your mother, Augusta Summers. Torn from the letter we found beside the body. At the very least, I'd say it ties McCaffrey to the scene. It's stuff like this that reminds us that for every murder, for every petty reason another person murders a lover, a partner, a prostitute, a transient, there is always a bereft mother or father who somehow have to live on with all the joy taken from their lives. Turning around, as we're about to leave, we see... Whoa! Is that a bloody shirt? Just like all the others in every case so far, we've found a blood-spattered shirt like this just sort of casually laying out. Wait a minute, when we talked with Grover, we didn't get the impression that we were dealing with a moron who would leave a bloody shirt lying on the floor of his apartment after murdering a woman. But inspecting the windows, we see that they're all closed. None of them are broken. In some of the previous cases, when we found damning evidence like this, it's always been beneath a broken or recently opened window, or in an office, in a business, open to the public, that anyone could have gained access to. But carefully inspecting Grosvenor's apartment here, we see all the windows whole and shut, and his front door was locked, how then can we explain this shirt being here unless McCaffrey put it here himself? And lying next to the blood spattered shirt. He said he was at home. He said he didn't know her. And we have the book. Let's see, Carruthers argue his way out of this one. Is that you, Grosvenor? Who are you guys? What are you doing in here? We're from the LAPD, ma'am. Do you know where we might find McCaffrey? I'm his neighbor. Is he in trouble? Look, lady, we need to find him, and in a hurry. Are you going to give me trouble? He has a pigeon coop up on the roof. He spends his mornings up there when he's been drinking. How do we get up there? Down the hall and up the stairs. Drunk and in command of a carrier pigeon. Hmm. Surely we can ride him up for that. A citation, at least. So like Evelyn, Grosvenor McCaffrey likes to drink. Could he have murdered her while drunk? But why did he do it with a tool that came from the bowling alley where Tiernan worked? For such an erudite revolutionary, he sure spends a lot of time getting drunk at a pub, hanging out at bowling alleys, and spying on transients. Let's see what he has to say for himself. Heading to the third floor, we can take the staircase to the roof. Here we find Grosvenor petting his pet pigeon. Grosvenor McCaffrey! 
McCaffrey. Running on a hangover, McCaffrey? Sit down and we'll talk. Son of a bitch. I'll go get our wheels. And of course, he runs. Taking the fire escape, we can try to slide down as fast as possible to save time. And once on the ground, Grosvenor takes us up some stairs and through the gardens of nearby houses. Then he dashes across the street. You a runner, McCaffrey? Stay there he is. A good fight. See him? He takes us through more gardens, across another street, over a fence, until he begins to lose steam and we can finally tackle him. McCaffrey, you're under arrest on suspicion of murdering Evelyn Summers. We need to get downtown and wrap this thing up. It's got to be McCaffrey. Unless Taranen set him up. I don't think that asshole Jameson could have done it, do you? Uh, whoever did it, at least it wasn't that Dahlia fuck. How do you know that McCaffrey didn't do the Dahlia? We have a list of over 200 suspects. His name was never on it. If you think the list is exhaustive, Rusty, who am I to argue? Listen, let's just work the case at hand, shall we? Then we can sit down and put all the puzzle pieces together at a later date. I'll hold you to that. Arrive back at Central at 7.16 p.m. Heading inside, we find the captain waiting for us. You sure you can make it stick with one of these suspects, gentlemen? It's either McCaffrey or Tiernan, sir. I think Jameson is an aberration. All right. I'll deal with that degraded lunatic myself. He's got some fearful retribution coming. Tiernan is in one, McCaffrey is in two. I want a confession from one of them. Don't fail me, young Phelps. All right, so it looks like Jameson's off the table. Good to know that the captain's going to be taking care of him. We'll start by moving to interview room one to talk with Tiernan. Why did you run, Tiernan? I was the last one to see Evelyn that night. I knew you would think it was me. But what he did right there is confess that he knew that Evelyn was dead. You only know if you're the last one to see someone that night if you know that she's dead. But then again, could he have heard about her death over the radio? We'll start by asking about his relationship with Evelyn. Can you describe your relationship with Evelyn? I, I barely knew Evelyn. Oh, Tiernan. Do we have to play this game? In addition to his uncomfortable body posture, crossing his arms, sitting back awkwardly in his chair, eyes darting from side to side, we know that he's lying here. Keep lying to me and I'll have you charged and in front of a grand jury before your feet touch the ground. <laughs> How can you possibly prove Evelyn and I were more than friends? Because we have eyewitness testimony from McCaffrey that he saw Tiernan enter a hotel room with Evelyn on the night of her murder. McCaffrey gave you up, Tiernan. He says he saw you go into your hotel with Evelyn. I met Evelyn at the public library. We would read for a while and then go for a drink. Last night, we went back to my hotel room and had some more to drink. I must have passed out. I woke up and she was gone. What time was this? Around midnight, maybe later. And there's no one who can confirm this? No, there isn't. I knew you wouldn't believe me. A convenient story. So drunk that he was passed out, he has no idea what happened that night. It's clear he knew her better than he's letting on. Maybe he also knew about her penchant for reading Aristotle. Aristotle's Metaphysics, the book that belonged to McCaffrey. McCaffrey saw her looking at her once and laughed in her face. And you're saying Evelyn stole it. She wanted something of his. Okay, but when did she have the opportunity to steal a book from McCaffrey's apartment? And did she really just want something of his because she wanted to spite him? Something about that answer isn't adding up. His body posture seems better, though. He meets eyes with Cole Phelps. He's sitting forward with his arms resting comfortably on the table. Really, the only thing that causes us to doubt his story here is the strangeness of his response. 
She took the book just because she wanted something of his. That doesn't give us enough to work on, and so we can doubt that he's telling us the whole story. We either hang this on you or McCaffrey. You better give us something. <laughs> well, McCaffrey's been in trouble with the law before. I mean, he always makes out it was some kind of labor dispute, but, you know, I'm, I'm not so sure. Oh, well, we didn't learn much about the book, but we just learned a lot about McCaffrey. Sounds like we'll have to look into his arrest record. Now James told us that he just passed out in his hotel room. That doesn't make for a good alibi. Maybe he can come up with something better. You and Evelyn were drinking together last night, and she had no other place to stay. I don't know what happened last night. I, I don't remember. He doesn't remember, but his eyes are flitting around as if he's trying to remember. And if he's trying to remember something of what happened that night, then something else must have happened that night. He's uncomfortable. His face is twitching. But you know what? We know he's holding out on us, and we have the evidence to prove it. You're lying, Tiernan. You've been fighting with her. You fought and- I'm not lying! She got up and left! That was it! And yet we have the testimony from Robbins that Evelyn came back to his shop to buy a bottle of rye to give to a boy after an argument. Since we know she spent time in Tiernan's hotel room, the argument must have been with Tiernan. Using the liquor purchase as evidence, we can prove to him that we know he's holding out on us. She left, but she came back. She bought you a quart of whiskey to make it up to you. She told the liquor store owner, you're in deep trouble, buddy. She said she loved me. She wanted to care for me. But she would never stop talking about McCaffrey. McCaffrey was a writer, and McCaffrey was a hero. McCaffrey cared for the little guy. Did you kill her, Tiernan? I might as well have. I kicked her out. She had nowhere to go. Now we're getting a bit of remorse from this kid, and that's typically not something we find in a killer. But then again, the murder weapon we found was from Rawlings Bowling Alley, the same bowling alley where Tiernan worked. Do you own a car, Tiernan? No, I don't. Hmm. Have access to a lug wrench? No, we use a lot of them to clear jams in the pin setting machines. He is very forthcoming with that information, as if he doesn't know a lug wrench was used in the murder. And yet, after answering so nonchalantly, he again looks around the room suspiciously. Because of his behavior here, we're gonna play a bit of bad cop to see if we can get him to spill the beans. The coroner's report says that Evelyn was killed with a wrench. I think you did it and then planted the evidence at McCaffrey's apartment for us to find. We went to his apartment. M McCaffrey was up on the roof. Evelyn stole the book. <laughs> McCaffrey went crazy when he found out. He said, he said he would put her out of her misery. He can be very cruel. So he admits that he was in McCaffrey's apartment. That's when Evelyn stole the book. But wait a minute, you can't plant a bloody wrench and a bloody shirt in an apartment before actually murdering the woman. According to his story, he and Evelyn went there together. He would have had to have murdered her later that night and come back to McCaffrey's apartment to plant this evidence there. We now have to decide whether or not we want to charge him, but there are just too many unanswered questions. We can't charge him yet. Evelyn was missing a ring from her right hand. That's strange. She always wore it. A uh, big black circular disc with a white E in the middle. It was made from an old typewriter key, a present from the prop department at her old movie studio. We're going to talk to McCaffrey. You need to think about what you've told us, Tiernan. You're not in the clear. Well, now we know what the ring looks like. Important in case we find it later. Now, we'll head to interview room two to talk with Grosvenor McCaffrey. You know you've made it if you can get that. You ready to answer some questions? You think I have all the answers? People who run from the police usually have something to hide. Touché, detective. Let's see where this takes us. Oh, <laughs> this guy. I really hope he's the killer. I'd like to wipe that smug look off his face. We'll start by trying to establish exactly where he was at the time Evelyn was being murdered. Evelyn died sometime around midnight. Remind me, where were you? I was at home, writing. I'm working on a manuscript. Of course you're working on a manuscript. 
But here he goes and defaults right back to his rather confused facial expressions, as if he's a bit of a lost puppy. Looking up, looking down, looking side to side, looking everywhere, but at Cole Phelps. But you know what? We do have a piece of evidence that suggests that he was nowhere near his apartment that night. You're lying, McCaffrey. You were out at the rail yard. And what do you have that proves I was there? In his apartment, we found the bottom half of a letter from Evelyn's mother. That could only be in his apartment if the killer put it there. Now, we know Evelyn was at his apartment. That's when she stole the book. But she also survived that encounter. She had time to go back to the liquor store to place the book amongst her possessions. This means the most likely explanation for the letter being in his apartment is that he took it from her while killing her. How about half of Augusta Summer's last correspondence with her daughter? What are you talking about? After you were done beating Evelyn, you searched her and found her mother's letter. That old lady's anguish amused you. I know nothing about a letter or Evelyn's goddamn mother. So what was it doing on your writing desk? I don't know, but if I didn't put it there, somebody else did. Try exercising your powers of deduction on that. Okay, and he feigns ignorance. Or maybe he's not feigning anything at all. Maybe he really does have no idea where the letter came from. If someone planted the letter, they could have planted the bloody shirt and the tire iron. Speaking of which, let's see what he has to say about the lug wrench. We found the lug wrench that Evelyn was battered with in your apartment, and the note from her mother, and your blood-stained clothing. We have you cold, McCaffrey. You think if I could be bothered to murder Evelyn Summers, I would be stupid enough to leave the evidence in my apartment? He raises a good point. You would have to be mind-numbingly stupid to murder a woman, rip her note in half, gingerly put that half back in her purse, take the other half with you, place it on your writing desk, and then take off the shirt you were wearing when you killed her, throw it on the floor of your room, right next to the murder weapon, which you don't throw away, you drop on the floor of your room, then dress up all fancy, and go to the local pub for a drink. That's not the behavior of even a moderately intelligent person. But it might be the behavior of a drunk person. We learned from his neighbor that he has a habit of being drunk. When he's drunk, he likes to go out onto the roof and feed the pigeons. Haven't you got parking tickets to hand out? Oh, you smug jerk. Because of that little quip, we'll go ahead and accuse this guy. I don't believe you, Grosvenor. The evidence says that you killed her. You can prove that I wanted to kill Evelyn? The evidence we'll use is Tiernan's accusation. He suggested that McCaffrey's criminal past might not have been just about trade disputes and picket lines. And he has said that when McCaffrey learned that Evelyn stole his book, he threatened her life. Maybe when he's drunk, he's a violent drunk. And maybe when he's drunk, He's a stupid violent drunk. A stupid violent drunk that murders women for stealing from him and then stupidly drops all of the evidence on the floor of his apartment. Tiernan is prepared to testify that you threatened Evelyn's life in his presence. Self-preservation. That's understandable. Okay, I'll level with you. Tiernan killed Evelyn. He came to me for help. I listened to him and he explained why he did it. Tiernan went to you for help. You expect me to buy that? That's how it went down. I told him he made a terrible mistake, but he would be throwing his life away if he went to the cops. I took his things and told him I would dispose of them. But you didn't. Speak to Tiernan. He'll give it up. Whoa, okay, uh... Well, it's beginning to look a lot less like a Black Dahlia killing if he admits that he took possession of the murder weapon, the torn note, and the blood-spattered shirt. Though Galloway does raise a good point. If McCaffrey agreed to get rid of the murder evidence, why didn't he? Seems like we have a bit of a tit-for-tat going on between Tiernan and McCaffrey here. We need an ace in the hole, something we can use to shake McCaffrey up. Before we go and talk with Tiernan about McCaffrey's latest accusation, we can call into r and I using the nearby phone to learn more about McCaffrey's criminal past. I need the jacket on a Grosvenor McCaffrey. 
Just a moment, detective. McCaffrey was formerly under surveillance by the Red Squad. Convictions for petty theft. Dishonorable discharge from the Army during training at Syracuse. Assault on a local woman. Says he almost beat the woman to death. Thanks for your help. So, he was dishonorably discharged from the army due to assaulting a local woman. So he has a record, a history of abusing women. That might come in handy. But first, let's tell Tiernan about McCaffrey's accusation. You know you've got it made if you can get- You've spoken to McCaffrey? I can go, it's all been cleared up? Not quite. We have one more question we need to ask, James. Then I think we will be done. Sure, go ahead. Let's see if we can get Tiernan to reconstruct the scene. So Evelyn passed out, and you walked out. What happened next? I woke up in the morning. Mary hung over. I thought Evelyn would have come back. Uh, I don't think Cole got those events right. I think he should have said so. Tiernan passed out, and Evelyn walked out. Remember, that's when Evelyn went to the liquor store to buy him a present. There are some chronological issues with this murder. We'll get to them in a bit. But our goal here is to try and check out whether or not McCaffrey's latest story is true. And so we'll accuse Tiernan of lying. I know you're lying, James. You went out looking for her. Tell me what really happened. I don't know what you're talking about. How, how can you say I wasn't in that hotel room? Let's see how he reacts when we tell him that McCaffrey told us that he confessed to the killing. You wound up in McCaffrey's. You were still incredibly drunk. You passed out on his floor. It's time to tell me what really happened. McCaffrey woke me up the next morning. And he showed me the lug wrench and the letter and the box. And he said I came in with him last night. He said that I killed Evelyn. And that it was all over the radio. And that he would protect me. And I don't know, detective, for the life of me, I can't remember a goddamn thing. I'm, I was angry with her, really angry. I could have done it. it. Wasn't me. So he admits to going back to McCaffrey's room. That would explain why we find the murder weapon there. But this is the first story we've heard that sounds at all like McCaffrey's personality. Is McCaffrey the kind of guy who would, out of the goodness of his heart, go out of his way, do everything he could to help Tiernan escape conviction to hide the fact that Tiernan was a murderer? Or is McCaffrey the kind of guy who would manipulate a guy like Tiernan? who would pretend to be his friend, who would pretend to be on his side, all because he's really using Tiernan, because he wants to make Tiernan appear to be the murderer. Is Tiernan guilty? Wait here. Remember McCaffrey told us the story, and then he told us to check in with Tiernan, confident that Tiernan would crumble and corroborate his story. This has all been a game for McCaffrey. He's been enjoying it, trying to prove that he's smarter than everyone, smarter than Tiernan, smarter than Cole. But we know something about McCaffrey that he doesn't know that we know. We know about his criminal record. And so we can head back to talk with him about his military service. You were in the war? Yes, I was. Seeing the things that I saw, it changes a man. I came back here determined to change things. All I wanted was a pen and an opportunity to speak out. You told us before that you had only minor run-ins with the police. You didn't mention petty theft. I've never been in trouble for violence. That's the salient point here, isn't it? Oh, sure. War changes a man. If we had only seen the things that he saw. But really, we have evidence that he never actually saw combat. You're lying, McCaffrey. You have a history of violence towards women. How do you turn a couple parking tickets in a petty theft misdemeanor into an assault charge? 
But we've got it all. We learned from R&I that he was dishonorably booted from the army before he completed training because he assaulted a woman, which means he never saw combat. This is the evidence we can use to prove that he's lying and to see if it shakes him up. We know all about you and your dishonorable discharge. Beating some poor woman near to death in Syracuse. He's never been in combat, McCaffrey. Your whole life is a fraud. She was a goddamn peasant whore. She tried to steal from my wallet. I could have fought for this country. I could have. You beat her because she stole from you. Because she tried to outsmart you. The ignorant audacity of the bitch. What is a man supposed to do? Sit there and take it? How is a man supposed to call himself a man? And Evelyn Summers, a poor, drunken nobody, stole your book. And she got what was coming to her. I still have a few questions, but you know what? I think we have all the evidence we need to put this egotistical, manipulating murderer behind bars. It wasn't Tiernan, it was McCaffrey. Grosvenor McCaffrey, I'm charging you with the murder of Evelyn Summers. She was a sad lady who never hurt anyone except herself. I hope God finds a way to forgive you. Congratulations, boys. You bagged the fine catch. Another red to boot. Grand. Now, I want you to put this business about a repeat offender out of your mind. This McCaffrey creature shows no remorse, and neither will the grand jury. You would have to walk a long mile to find a better candidate for an unmarked plot at the prison graveyard. This case is one of the most confusing on the homicide desk. Up till now, we've been getting conviction after conviction. We still find a suspect to charge, but all of the evidence has something weird about it. Something is missing. Something was tampered with, leading us to the suspicion that we haven't found the real killer. These suspicions are more or less confirmed by the captain, Carruthers, and Ray Pinker in this murder. But this murder seems to have the most airtight evidence, and we appear to have found the real killer. We found no evidence of a break-in at McCaffrey's house, which means if the murder weapon and the bloody shirt and the torn letter were planted by someone other than McCaffrey, then that someone must have come through the front door. And since we don't find damage to the front door, that someone must have had a key, known McCaffrey, or managed to pick it, plant the evidence, leave, and somehow relock it, which is a bit of a leap. Then there's the issue that both McCaffrey and Tiernan knew that the murder weapon was there. McCaffrey claimed that Tiernan walked into his apartment with the murder weapon. Tiernan claimed to have woken up from a drunken stupor only to be shown the murder weapon by McCaffrey. And there's another problem. When we talked with Robbins, the guy at the liquor store, he said that he hadn't seen Evelyn since that morning when she came to buy a bottle of whiskey. She came by in the morning. A social visit to pick up some of her things. She had a couple of bucks and bought a quart of rye. The problem is that we learned that she didn't have an argument with Tiernan until late that night. Even if she was coming in to buy a bottle of liquor for McCaffrey to say sorry for stealing the book, that event also didn't happen until the evening. So how could she be in the liquor store that morning before those events took place, buying a bottle of liquor for a boy with whom she had an argument, which incidentally was a key piece of evidence we used to get the truth out of Tiernan, if she didn't even have that argument with him until later that night? There's a big problem with the evidence we're getting in this story. Really, it's Robin's testimony that makes things complicated, even though it is also his testimony that allows us to get a crucial clue from Tiernan. If Robbins is telling the truth, then we have to conclude that Evelyn and Tiernan must have had some other argument. Remember, McCaffrey told us that he saw Evelyn and Tiernan go into the hotel room with a bottle of whiskey. So she already had the bottle before she went to meet Tiernan. They must have had some other argument besides the one they had that night, possibly an argument about McCaffrey. So putting the evidence together, we can finally paint a story of what happened that day. After having not seen Robbins for a few days, Evelyn shows up not to collect her things, but to buy a bottle of whiskey for Tiernan after having had an argument with him previously. 
perhaps the night before. She then goes to meet Tiernan, going to the bowling alley perhaps, whereupon they went to McCaffrey's house for some undisclosed reason. While there, Evelyn steals McCaffrey's book, but McCaffrey catches her doing it and chews her out. Despite this, she doesn't leave the book. She and Tiernan leave McCaffrey's apartment. They stop by the liquor store again to drop off the book. Remember, we found the book amongst her other things, but they must have done so while evading Robbins. Otherwise, he would have told us that the last time he saw her was when she came to drop off the book. Instead, he told us he hadn't seen her since she came in that morning to buy a bottle of whiskey. So they drop off the book, then go to a hotel room. But McCaffrey was so enraged that some transient woman stole his book that he began to follow her. That's the only way he could have observed Tiernan and Evelyn enter a hotel room with a bottle of whiskey. He must have missed them dropping the book off at Evelyn's place. Otherwise, I'm sure he would have just gone there to take it back. McCaffrey then waits outside the hotel while Tiernan and Evelyn proceed to get drunk. While drunk, they have an argument. She's still talking all about McCaffrey and Tiernan and is getting jealous, wondering why she's talking about McCaffrey if she says she loves him. He kicks her out of his apartment and then passes out. Evelyn, with nowhere left to go, starts to head back to the liquor store where she has all of her things, but McCaffrey lies in wait for her, wanting his book back. He confronts her but discovers she doesn't have it and in a drunken rage, murders her. Placing the body in the rail yard, taking half of her letter for some inexplicable reason, and bringing the murder weapon and his bloody shirt back to his apartment, again for some unexplicable reason. Then, as luck would have it, Tiernan wakes up in the middle of the night, sees that Evelyn is gone, and then instead of going to the liquor store where he knows she lives, he decides to go to McCaffrey's house, because they're just best buds, right? Whereupon, he immediately blacks out again. This is McCaffrey's lucky day. He just murdered a woman, has all this incriminating evidence, and by golly, wouldn't you know it, her boyfriend shows up at his door drunk as a skunk. He then hatches his plan to incriminate Tiernan and then deludes the poor guy into thinking that he killed Evelyn when he wakes up the next morning. He sends Tiernan on his way terrified of cops, which is why Tiernan flees when we approach him, and keeps all of the murder evidence with the ultimate goal of incriminating him. This is the story we have to believe if McCaffrey really did kill Evelyn, but I don't think it makes sense. Remember, we found her body at a train yard, and it wasn't just dropped there. That was where she was murdered. We found blood spatter from her lethal injury on one of the train cars. The evidence points to a surprise attack. She didn't see it coming. Not an attack that came from a scuffle because McCaffrey was trying to get his book from her. And there's the problem of the missing ring. No one had the ring with them. We never found it in McCaffrey's apartment. Who took the ring? Here's what I think really happened. The Black Dahlia killer, the real killer, found her walking the train tracks after she was kicked out of Tiernan's apartment. He killed her opportunistically, stole her ring for his own purposes, went through her things, found the note, ripped it in half and took one half with him. Then he saw the inventory list, realizing that she lived at the liquor store. He traveled to the liquor store, found the book she had stolen from Grosvenor earlier that day, then looked up his address in an address book. In the middle of the night while everyone was sleeping, he picked the lock to Grosvenor's apartment, planted the note, the murder weapon, and the bloody shirt then hightailed it out of there. A bit later, Tiernan shows up at Grosvenor's house, finds the front door unlocked, lets himself in and crashes. Grosvenor then wakes up, finds Tiernan on his couch and his front door wide open. I guess he doesn't stop to wonder how a drunk man picked his lock because he's shocked by finding the murder weapon, a bloody shirt and half a note. Tiernan then wakes up, starts asking about Evelyn, and McCaffrey puts it together. Oh, Tiernan must have killed Evelyn. This is the murder weapon. He explains it to Tiernan, and Tiernan leaves terrified. Grosvenor promises to destroy the evidence, but he doesn't really care. He's got other things to do. He's a revolutionary. He's a rioter. He'll deal with it later. Plus, the cops are so stupid and beneath him, and Evelyn was just a transient. No one will come looking for her. Certainly not make it to his apartment. So he heads out the door, goes to the bar, drinks a bit, reads the paper, until we find him. That's the best story I can put together based on the conflicting testimonies and the strange evidence we find. But what are your thoughts? Did Grosvenor really kill Evelyn? Or is it really the yet-to-be-apprehended Black Dahlia murderer? 
Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. I publish many videos here on my channel each and every week, so if you want to make sure you don't miss my next episode, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I have a brand new shirt in the shop. Proud graduate of Oxhorn's Driving School. That's right, my skills behind the wheel of a vehicle in L.A. Noire are hard to ignore. This design comes on shirts in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. It comes on other products as too, like smartphone cases, pillows, posters, mugs, stickers, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming a patron on Patreon or a member here on YouTube. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with more brand new videos.